namaste a very warm welcome to all of you on the concluding day of the asia pacific regional training on gender equality and human rights as you all know this three day online training program has been co organized uh, please excuse me can we can we mute our mic microphones can we mute this is a beautiful song but uh, we can hear it a little later thank you as you know this three day online training program has been co organized by the asian pacific resource and research center for women and cns to help media and gender justice advocates strengthen their engagement around gender equality and human rights in the asia pacific region Uh, just a few quick housekeeping announcements before we begin participants please mute you, mute yourself while the speakers present there will be an open question and answer session after the presentation of each resource person please type in your questions and comments in the chat box or raise your virtual hand if you wish to speak to ask your question we need your support to make the session as interactive as possible so please do not hesitate to clarify your doubts and share your comments and queries also one last request we are living in difficult times and many of us are still working from home so please pardon and bear with any technical glitches which may arise that are beyond our control due to poor internet connectivity and i thank you for your patience and understanding as we know during the last two days we have covered modules 1 2 3 and 5 of arrows media training manual on gender equality for the asia pacific region uh, all of you must be having the manual with you and we have had very vibrant and interactive information sharing sessions continuing from where we left yesterday today we will cover module 4 of the manual i would like to invite rita vidyadana to share some tips for gender sensitive and responsible reporting rita is a very senior columnist and former editor of jakarta post indonesia she is currently based in bali one of the cities of my dreams over to you rita many thanks soba many thanks hi everyone good morning hi. good afternoon uh, thank you again for uh, uh, allowing me to be part of this a uh, very important discussion thank you Bo bobby thank you soba uh, for inviting me uh, i would like to share uh, not tips but my experience uh, of uh, writing a gender issue in my country in indonesia uh, what challenge talents do uh, did we uh, face during the course of our works and maybe uh, this is just a, a highlight a brief summary maybe we can uh, start following this uh, with a uh, live discussion and i really want to uh, hear about the experience of my college here from the asia pacific region so we can have a uh, connection and uh, improve our understanding of each particular region and how we can improve our work as a journalist as a advocate and as a uh, maybe policy maker here and i hope that you still have energy after three days after two days uh, and this is our concluding uh, session yes uh, uh, soba this is yes, our yes concluding. yes yeah yes okay. yes Uh, maybe uh, i will just start uh, uh, i'm i was at the jakarta post uh, morning daily in indonesia and english uh, daily and uh, after that i'm start uh, becoming a freelance journalist and writers especially focusing on child and women rights issue on health and development and I start uh, joining Soba and Bobby to be a member of the Asia Pacific um, Journal Media Alliance for Health and Development. Uh, maybe we can start, and then we can follow with uh, our discussion. Forgive me, uh, this is Bali, so my house is next to a school 
which is now practicing gamelan orchestra. I, I'm, I'm, I do apologize for the loud voice. Thank you. Okay, uh, maybe we can start. Um, yes, um, my, my focus today is how, uh, as a journalist, we have the responsibility to write and to uh, produce writing that is promoting gender equality. Because uh, the media plays a very significant role in shaping public perceptions about women and men. And therefore it is important that reporting avoids any forms of gender set stereotypes, which often limit and trivialize females and males as well as presenting an inaccurate view of the world and its possibility. Furthermore, the use of stereotypes reflect a mental block, not only in terms of what society may expect from women and men, but also more seriously in terms of what women and men may expect from themselves. This is I'm quoting from the UNESCO. Okay. Uh, Bobby, next screen, okay. Uh, why is gender? Because gender is everywhere. We live in society that are consisted of men and women and throughout history, different cu culture have attributed different roles, limitation and privilege for men and women. Gender refers to the aspect that a so society or cultures Forgive me, this is uh, Azan, forgive me. Gender involves the socializations of boys and girls and the roles conferred to men and women. But this definition may change and differ in each society throughout the story, his story. Soba, may I stop a little bit because this yes. is too loud? No, I think we can hear you clearly. It's, I okay. think your voice is fine, yes. Okay, thank you. Is it disturbing the voice? It, it is there, but uh, it's fine. We can hear you clearly. So okay, thank you so much. So we can uh, continue, yes, Bobby. Yes. Okay, gender concepts are found in all aspects of life, including journalism. This is very important because journalist works cover all aspects of life. When the concept of gender is understood society will become healthier and more equal. According to Judith Butler, a, a very expert in gender, gender is a performative, that is, it is actively produced within social interaction. And media being an integral part of this proof of social construction, it is thus legitimate to explore the gender dimensions of news production and receptions. So we know all that quality journalism is ethical journalism and that ethical journalism include full and fair representations of action, opinions, concerns, and aspirations of women around the world. That's according to W. W.A. She's Deputy General Secretary Lavinia Moore. So we know our responsibility as a journalist. Uh, next, Bobby. So in order to achieve that, we have to apply gender sensitive reporting as our responsibilities as journalists and writers. So we are all aware that each story we write must answer the five W and one H. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. The same questions can be applied to gender sensitive journalism as outlined before. Bobby, next screen. So we start with the first W, who, who can do that. All journalists can play a role in changing attitude toward women and gender-based stereotypes. The second W, what, 
to be more aware of gender issue and integrate this awareness into our work, to be sensitive to gender inequalities, to portray and treat women and men in fair and just manner, to produce coverage that is complete and diverse, it is essential that the news mir mirrors the world as seen through the eyes of women as well as men. And the third Y, the third W is why. Why gender sensitive reporting is essential to contributing to a more balanced representations of society. Gender equality is an integral part of freedom of expression which is our human rights. Fair and gender portrayal is an ethical aspiration like respect for accuracy, fairness, and honesty. Bobby? Where, where can we apply this gender <coughs> equality in our news organization, be it newspaper, television, radio, social media, in short, in all forms of media at the managerial level, where the general directions are made, in the editorial department, where decisions are made about stories to be covered, and in the field when information is being gathered. When, from now on, start now. How? By being aware of the language we use, by being open-minded and fair, and through careful selections of stories and the resource and sources, the natures of news, the choice made about what is newsworthy and the way the story is reported must change. Women need to be used more as the sources and subject of stories. They need to be interviewed as commentators and experts. Next. So uh, with this in mind, uh, we still see a, a bleak pictures in the media profiles in our Asia Pacific region. Uh, according to a study by UN Women Asia Pacific, women are entering the media professional in a large number, yes. Yet their representation across, across all areas of the media remains inadequate. On average, across Asia and the Pacific, women make up 28.6% of the media work, workforce. However, the proportions are lower in decision-making roles in media organization where women make up only 17.9% of executive roles. 19.5% of senior editorial and 22.6% of mid-level editorial positions. Women continue to be restricted by stereotypical bits and face more job insecurity, lower wage and gender discrimination, but they are actually multi-skilled and usually working more bits than men. The worst thing is sexual harassment remains a key issue with 34% journalists in Asia and the Pacific saying they had witnessed sexual harassment at work. At least 17% seven, of female journalists have personally experienced workplace sexual harassment and 59% of the time it is a superior who is the perpetrators, which is uh, this harrowing situation for us. Uh, next, Bobby. Okay, so this is our uh, responsibility to us ourselves as a media people, as a gender advocate, especially for media. This is the important checklist. Does your media house have a program on diversity and representations of women at the senior management level? Does your organization have a policy to equip women so that they can be considered for senior positions? 
Does your organization have policy on sexual harassment procedures and process for dealing with complaints? Does your organization have a gender policy and it is, is this well known to all employee? Does your organization regularly sensitize staff on gender bias, stereotypes, and discrimination on the basis of sex? Ideally, the answer to each of the questions should be yes. Any no response is a call for action. So we have to uh, contemplate ourselves. We have to check with our own news organization whether we have all this program to promote gender quality. Okay. Um, next, Bobby. So this can be achieved when we careful use of language and image because we are journalists, we are writers, we are advocates because language matters. Language does not merely reflect the way we think, it also shapes our thinking. If words and expression that imply that women are inferior to men are constantly used, that assumptions of inferiority tends to become part of our mindset. Hence, we need to adjust our language when our ideas evolve. Next. As journalists, writers, and advocates, we continue to struggle choosing the proper words in our stories and making sure every word we pick convey the correct message. Gender-sensitive journalism requires media people to be careful not to fit into the cycle of sexist news making. Journalists have a responsibility to not reproduce it with our use of words, expression, and ways of storytelling, which might it advertently reflect and even reinforce gender power dynamics and stereotyping. Next. Bobby, next. So we have to focus on our words our sentence, our phrase when writing stories, because sexism is inherent in many expression in almost all language, our own language, our local language. We hear day, every day, every minute, because we were born in that society. There are many sayings which are used to denigrate the role of women, such as to behave like a woman, this expression is used as a as deep depicts women as weak. And when men demonstrate cowardice or weakness in any situation, the expression is used to describe their behavior, to behave like women. And then crying like a girl, that's that, oh boy, don't cry. That's such a demeaning phrase. Crying is often perceived as weakness. Many parents use these phrases when trying to calm young boys when they are crying. These words are meant to demonstrate that only girls can fend their emotion by allowing them to cry in public, while boys are expected to be strong. This another demeaning phrases, men's words. Those who want to be sure of each other words sometimes use the phrase, give a man's word. This suggests that only men can be trusted to keep their word, not women. This kind of phrases that we have to avoid in writing our works. Next, Bobby. Okay. This may be simple tips. When we, when we start writing, always question the words and expression we use. Trace the root. Many expressions you have been hearing and using for years may contain sexist implication that you had not noticed until now. It is always useful to discuss the language with your editorial team and your colleagues. 
while writing the news using active sentence instead of passive is always important. Pay close attention to doing so, particularly when writing stories about women and girls. Next. Next. Well, this is journalist responsibilities. Actually, it's all responsibility, all people responsibilities. First, fight against cliches. Good storytelling and gender sensitive journalism should avoid cliches because most of them are actually gender related. But gender cliches are everywhere. Like women's fights against satellite, this cliche imply that women are obligated to conform to beauty norms, which are widespread worldwide. Number two is judgmental language. Another common mistake is the use of judgmental language. This is the major issue we need to tackle for the sake of gender sensitive reporting. Again, accuracy is fundamental to good journalism, journalism, but we know that it's not easy task and that it's not always possible to achieve. Research must be done carefully and facts must be checked and even cross-checked. Whenever possible, we should collect information firsthand by being there, but it, all, it is not always possible. If it's not possible, we should talk to those who were there. However, it is important to be aware of the differences between primary and secondary sources. We always make sure that we do not reflect exaggeration and gender bias judgments. We should be committed to being objective in our reporting. Next. Fighting stereotypes. Stereotype is a term used to define all people of a certain group as having certain behavior or characteristic, usually negative. Stereotypes are often wrong and can lead to discrimination. They offer simplify the reality and usually form the basic of prejudice. We as journalists and writers are members of our own society and have been shaped by that culture. And therefore we might therefore apply our cultural stereotypes to our news item without thinking, thereby inadvertently reinforcing them, deepening inequality and paving the way for stigmatizations and prejudice because this is unconsciousness because it's deeply ingrained in our mind because we live there in that society. Okay, next, Bobby. So there are many stereotypes attributed to gender. Here are some of the common female and male stereotypes. Female is always uh, portrayed as dependent while male is independent, male weak, while male is powerful, male is always female is always emotional, while male is logical. Female is always depicted as housekeepers, while male is portrayed as breadwinners. Female is always uh, portrayed as fragile, and male as protectors. Female soft-spoken, and male outspoken. This is stereotypes that we always hear that every minute, every hour, every day. So this is, this is uh, very important that we start uh, fighting these stereotypes in our news. Okay, next, Bobby. So the most common stereotype we, we produce as journalists in our stories, one, portraying women as extreme. If they do not fit the stereotype, for example, an unmarried woman who is sexually active is often portrayed as a sinner. And a woman who challenges a man, I'm sorry, I omit that, is always 
pictures and aggressive. Women always be portrayed as sex object. Many studies have proven that the media frequently portray women as sex object for men to look at and fantasize about. In news and advertising, image focus on women's body and their looks. The impression that women have nothing else to contribute to society. The third one is portraying women as victims. In many humanitarian crises, women are often portrayed as suffering victims. Women do suffer, but they also perform many heroic acts, such as rescuing the elderly and children, portraying them predominantly as victims diminish their roles in the society. Next. So this is our job is making women exist and visible in our news. Because this is the data is uh, portraying uh, unfavorable uh, pictures of our activities. So the word that journalists describe in the news media remained largely masculine. The 2015 Global, Global Media Monitoring Project revealed that women make up only 24% of those heard, read about, and seen in newspaper, television, and radio news. The report also said women relative invisibility in traditional news media has crossed over into digital news delivery platforms. Only 26% of the people in the in internet news stories and media news tweets are women. Only 4% traditional news and digital news stories explicitly challenge gender stereotypes. The International Labor Organization study reveals almost half of news stories, 46%, reinforce gender stereotypes. The studies say media representation normalizes the exclusions of women and girls. Women only make up 20% of expert news sources. The lack of inclusion of women experts has serious consequences. When male experts are prioritized, women's hard work and contribution are devalued and they are robbed of the recognition and public acclaim they deserve. Only 6% of news story highlight issue of gender equality and equality. This is saddening news that we have to work very hard to improve this situation. Next, Bobby. Okay, this is tips. When we cover about any event, we have to ask ourselves the question, where are the women in this event and this new story? Ask ourselves how this event will affect women. The answer to this question will give you the, the gender angle. Simply asking whether there is a women perspective to the story also helps. Try to find the women angle in the story. Look at women's rights struggles, follow civil society organizations which are working for women and girls and draw attention to their efforts. And we can also cover women scientists, women doctors, politicians, lawyers. So we put them in equal position in the society. So this is our uh, responsibility as journalists and writers. Next, Bobby. Uh, this is very difficult issue that most uh, journalists uh, think about covering gender-based violence because it's very uh, sensitive. Um, many are covered by taboo and uh, it's against the social norms in some society. So uh, this is challenging a uh, situation for any journalist to cover gender-based violence. We can 
uh, define gender-based violence as any harmful act that is perpetrated against any person's will and that is based on social ascribed differences between males and females. GBV serves as an umbrella terms which contains many acts like rape, sexual assault, domestic violence, child marriage, harmful traditional practice like female genital mutilations, trafficking in persons and various forms of mental and physical abuse. Journalists really need to expand their awareness on the issue. They need to learn about gender-based violence before writing, before covering, before reporting. So they, they have to learn deep, deep and gain of insightful knowledge on this particular issue before we produce news, before we spread message, before we reporting this issue to the white public. So they know exactly what they are talking about. They know exactly what they are writing and the impact of their writings on the survivors, the community, and most of all, on the perpetrators. So this is a basic principle of covering GBV. Never forget empathy. As journalists, we should never forget that individuals we speak with are all survivor. Many still write that they are victims, as Soba told us yesterday, please use the term survivors instead of victims. They, they, are, they have suffered from trauma or harmful act and therefore very vulnerable. It is our responsibility to treat them with careful and respectful. The word choice, victim versus survivor. While covering GBV news, there are certain terms that we should be very careful about using. The person subjected to GBV is often described in our news as victim. This is very wrong. Using this word survivor instead of victims is much better choices. Always respect privacy. Never share all the detail. All journalists, we all know that the 5W and 1H rule. But when covering GBV news, we can sometimes put this rule aside, writing the name of survivor who prefer to keep their identity confidential, giving detailed information could lead to serious and irreparable consequences. So we should not expose the, the, the the name of the identity of the survivors and make your story accurate. The story should not be written in a sensitive way and it should not be dramatized or romanticized. Unnecessary detail of sexualism and violence have no place in our news. Bobby? So this is ethical principle Consider while covering a GBV story. First is accuracy. Journalist interviews should be sensitive. They should also be sure that their reporting is factually correct. Fairness. Journalists should be fair and honest with interviews. When speaking to those who have ex experienced GBV, journalists are responsible for protecting their potentially vulnerable sources. Impartiality. We are newsmakers. This is not our job to judge or to discriminate. Journalists should be extremely careful when adding details that could unintentionally shift the focus of blame away from the aggressors. Duty to inform. Using an overabundance of personal details can sensationalize the news item. This should be avoided. Respecting privacy. To fully respect the privacy of GBP survivors and their loved ones, 
we should be careful how we present the information in order to avoid the possibility of jigsaw identification taking place. Sources, the main principle of journalism is to protect our sources. It's crucial, particularly for GBV news. For example, publishing the address of women's shelter or women's house in a piece or on male violence could have serious consequences. So this is do no harm principle. This principle has three angles. Showing sensitivity to people who are trau traumatized to survivors and actors. Being aware that the subject of the interview may be inexperienced in dealing with the media and understanding the balance between the public's right to information and the suspect right for a fair trial. When dealing with GBP survivors, we should always prioritize their best interests and adhere to the principle described earlier. Next, Bobby. Yo, this is very difficult. Uh, how to interview a sexual assault and rape survivor. Journalism is not an easy job. It can include many difficult situations. And interviewing a sexual or rape survivor is certainly one of the hardest tasks for us. But here are some tips maybe. Start with an open-ended question like, tell me about your experience. Be sim sympathetic, but keep it short. Start the conversation with something like, I'm sorry about what happened to you. Identify yourself and the media outlet you work for and indicate who the likely audience will be. Tell the survivor why you are there and with what it is that you want. Maybe it may be difficult for female survivor to tell their story to men and for male survivor to talk to women. If the interviewees cannot be a person of the same sex, make sure that the survivor is comfortable talking with someone of the opposite sex. Explain that you will not use the survivor's name unless they specifically want to. Stress that you will protect his and her identity. Uh, child marriage is one of a uh, serious child rights abuse and uh, one of GBV. Child marriage is a violation of human rights, of child rights, Young marriage girl face many difficulties such as early pregnancy. We must remember that every person under the age of 18 is considered a child unless stated otherwise in the applicable national leg legislations. Child and early marriage or forced marriage are considered GBV. So, we often have to cover child marriage. When covering child marriage news, emphasize in our story that human mar that child marriage is a crime and violation of basic human rights. Phrases con containing sexism or sexist approach must be avoided. Life stories are important for convincing the public of the existence prevalence and depth of the problem of forced marriage. However, it can be painful for women and girls to recall their experience. Publishing stories of girls who were forced to marry at an early age and were able to extricate themselves from the marriage can inspire others. But the story should not give the impression that all girls in that position will have the same experience. So not all girls are lucky enough. And how about interviewing a child? Well, this is in fundamentally better not to interview a child. However, in certain circumstances, journalists might choose to do so. In such an interview, 
is required, it must never take place without the presence of an adult who could be their parents or custodians, or in some specific cases, a teacher or someone working for a children's protection agency. Next. Oh, this is the stereotypes and pieces in visual because pictures portray means thousands of words. Gender also plays important role in visual communication. Stereotype and pieces can be found in photographs, in video, and explanatory graphic. They should not be encouraged or approved through nest hasty decision making. What is acceptable, what is an ex expectable, acceptable. Uh, this, this image is very uh, portraying stereotype. In hospital, the nurses always women, girls, and the doctors always a, a man. So this is stereotypes. In the second, this is doctors stand in front of uh, female nurses. These pictures stereotypes the roles of women and men in the society. So we must be very careful when we choose pictures for publication. We must be aware of certain aspects to ensure we avoid them. So this is the right pictures. Is a good. Is because this is famous female doctors, accompanied by male and female nurses, and they sit equally. So this is important as a journalist, as a photo editors, to be careful in picking up all uh, pictures and video and uh, any graphic that will demeaning uh, uh, the roles of women in, in, in news. Next. So picking the right photograph, video, video and visual. Our choice of pictures, graphic and or footage is extremely important because this image strengthen the story and are sometimes more effective than the words. But, but if we want to develop our new stories from a gender sensitive approach, there are some traps that we must be careful not to fall into. There are some ethical consideration that all journalists should take into account, always protect the anonymity of the GBV survivors, avoid choosing images that reproduce the certain cliches such as photographs or beaten women, Never use sexy or sexuality evoking photograph for GBV news. Next. Oh, this is the important point that we must avoid when we are trying to write gender insensitive reporting, avoid gender in insensitive reporting. So this is the checklist. Are women views and voices sold equally? Are male and female subjects treated equally? Have a variety of sources representing a broad, a broad spectrum of views been consulted? Does the coverage raise critical question as to why women are not represented? Does the coverage reflect a holistic and realistic view of women? Does the story challenge or reinforce stereotypes? Are these stereotypes blatant or subtle? Does the story exonerate the perpetrators? perpetrators? Are all subjects treated with dignity? Are the experiences and concerns of women belittled? Is your story fair, accurate, and balanced? Is there adequate context and balance and analysis which includes going beyond the event to highlight the underlying issue. Does your article contain language that is inclusive of men and women? For instance, are gender neutral terms used instead of gender bias terms? Are women and men equally represented? Are women portrayed as the survivors? Are women portrayed as active and or passive? 
Do image emphasize or exaggerated physical or sexual aspect? Does the image degrade the dignity of women? This is, uh, I think, a very important checklist for us as reporters, as writers, to avoid gender insensitive reporting. I think we have to stop here and then we can start uh, sharing each other experience. Many thanks, Soba. Uh, over to you, Soba. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rita, for such a beautiful and extensive explanation of what ethical journalism should look like, not to be judgmental, dismantling stereotype attributes, and looking at every issue with a gender sensitive lens. Now we open for question and answers. We have a lot many comments and questions already. Uh, Nahid uh, Khalid uh, wants to know uh, if there are more female students or male students who study journalism, or is the poor male female ratio in media also linked to girls dropping out of school? Uh, maybe Rita? Exactly. Or, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> maybe yeah. some other expert expert can also uh, uh, jump in because yes, this yes. is exactly women mostly drop out school to get married exactly right right and and then also they are supposed to take up yesterday maitri was uh, telling in her presentation she's a very senior journalist in india that you know certain um, professions are again as rita also mentioned they are put into boxes these professions are good for women these are good for uh, men and uh, Maitre was uh, sharing her own experience that in her family they did not think that uh, she should be into this profession because it means staying out late having uh, very irregular working hours so that also determines that is the stereotype I think uh, which is being perpetrated. Uh, Mensin Dimi from PNG says she talks about the checklist uh, Rita had uh, mentioned for media organizations to have and she says it's a very important list but barely any organization has these committees unless it is a legal thing in that country. What do you have? Exactly. To say? Yes, yes. 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 Uh, it depends on uh, the news organization and the country. Do they have legal umbrella for protecting the journalists, especially female journalists, and whether they are uh, gender sensitive enough, uh, uh, whether they also imply gender mainstreaming in the newsroom, which is very rare. Yeah. I have to admit it, R very rare. Varuni from Thailand uh, wants to know how do we engage media in addressing patriarchy within the media to make progress on gender sensitive issues and gender use of gender sensitive language also. Because she says that very often uh, this gender insensitive language is used without even realizing that, is, is, that it is insensitive or it is fueling gender stereotypes. This so, is very true. Yes. This yes, is sir. very true. Because we live in a patriarchy society. We live in the Asia and Pacific region where male are always on top. And we, female journalists, in inferior position. So in any newsroom, we still struggle to fight against patriarchy uh, culture be it uh, with our own college or our supervisors or our boss or our new sources. We're still struggling to fight against that. Maybe uh, other uh, journalists from other country can uh, jump in and share their experience how to deal with patriarchy in their own newsroom and in their society. Yes, we will come, yes, we will come to that, yes, Rita. Amira says that again, she talks about the committees that where even where the committees are there, they do not hold meetings. And so their responsibility and accountability should be enforced. That even if just form, forming a committee, the committees is the first step, but then accountability should be there as well. Uh, uh, then this, this, yes. Yeah. yes, Rita, please continue. Uh, yeah, many newsroom in my country, uh, they have set up committee, but 
uh, we don't know whether they're uh, effective or not, and then we don't have any uh, organizations to take them accountable. But uh, there are some uh, strong news organization in Indonesia also uh, checking uh, with every uh, news media organization to see whether they have set up uh, the committee and they apply the gender sense, uh, mainstreaming in, the, in their newsroom. And it start uh, since uh, the, the thou, 2000, yeah? Uh, and, and they are very active now. And uh, we see uh, a very significant progress in gender mainstreaming in Indonesia. I don't know in other countries, maybe all our friends here can share their experience. So I really want to learn about that uh, from our uh, participant here, uh, how they cope with uh, gender mainstreaming in the newsroom. So I really want to hear uh, from our colleague here. Uh, and um, uh, Noor Jangsha has an important point to make. Uh, Noor says we only uh, talk of the gender perspective from male and female, which, but we should not leave the issues of LGBTIQ communities behind. So these groups should also be considered while uh, we are talking of gender justice and gender equality. Exactly. I'm so sorry. I didn't uh, include uh, uh, our uh, LGBT friends, uh, but uh, it is very important issue that we should address. And uh, we have to be very uh, careful in covering, in uh, presenting them because uh, many of stigma uh, surrounding uh, them. And uh, now we have to fight <coughs> against all the cliches, all stigma uh, against this uh, community. So I, I do apologize for not including them. I'm do, I do apologize. Uh, no, no, it's, it's not about apologizing. It is just uh, making sure that uh, we do not, uh, they are not left behind because that they are, they are part of that important exactly. part of, yes, yes. Exactly, exactly. I agree. And, uh, we have uh, uh, a comment rather from Kai Liago Valido that women journalists struggle to prove themselves in the field. And even when there are women journalists in a media house or representing some media, they get assigned for lifestyle, entertainment pages and beats and not for say the police beat or even the other beats are usually not assigned to them. Basically they are thought fit for lifestyle and entertainment. Rita, what do you have to say to that? Oh, I agree. I agree with you. But also uh, we have to, uh, well, in the past, uh, women are also, uh, that is stereotyping of female journalists. Uh, we have to uh, go to the bit like lifestyle, fashion, or, or cooking, recipe, uh, whatever. But I think we have to uh, explore more about this lifestyle uh, bit because we can do more like fashion. Fashion, we can, uh, we can write fashion from very different perspective from environmental issue, how they, how fashion industry pollute uh, uh, the earth and how women, uh, female fashion designer excels. So we can also uh, uh, stress the importance of people uh, uh, in fashion industry, in cooking industry. So it is not a, a, a light, Bit. It is a very meaningful bit as long as we understand how to uh, expose, how to present women in their, uh, in their industry. So I think uh, there is not a light or strong bit as long as we can uh, put our perspective, gender perspective in every coverage of uh, any issue, even in lifestyle issue. So I, I don't agree that lifestyle issue is light. It is meaningful as long as we have a gender perspective, we have a deep knowledge like cooking, the history of Indian cuisines, how uh, Indian cuisine spread into the world. That is history, that is politics, that is cultures, that is lifestyle. So 
I think there is no light bit uh, for female journalists as long as we really, really learn about this issue and present it in a very broad angles. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anne Nguyen says, uh, Anne is from Vietnam. I think currently she's in Australia, that social justice is still a big issue in many developing countries. So a lot of work and efforts for all of us to bring justice for all. And stereotypes are often hidden under what we call socio-cultural norms. And uh, they, are, uh, they are being fed into people generation after generation including us as receivers of knowledge. So that is, I think, where the unlearning and relearning process should start. Yes, Rita. It is true, very true. Uh, it is blanket in social, traditional, and religious norm, all the stereotypes, all the taboo. Yeah. So we have to uh, open the blankets, uh, by, you know, educating the people, educating our audience and changing our ways to write, our ways to communicate. That is fighting the stereotypes, fighting patriarchy, fighting gender equality, inequality. So this is our job as a journalist is to educate people also to provide what is good and what's right, what is acceptable, what is unacceptable in our society. I think, uh, I hope that it, we can also paving ways to creating social, more justice social uh, environment. Thank you. And Mahisur Rashtri has uh, stresses upon the same thing that there are things that we have been learning from our childhood. And we didn't even realize or think that these are gender sensitive issues until now. So it is a good thing that we are all trying to get over those normalized stereotypes and we are trying to denormalize them. So thank you very much, Rita, for this very, very, uh, very, very productive and informative uh, uh, session of uh, your presentation. And we will now go on to community led documentation in emergencies, Rita has mentioned a bit about it, uh, in emergencies or crisis situations and media engagement around such situations. Yes, over to you, Bobby. Yes, hello friends. <clears throat> so, uh, just looking at the time. Okay, fine. So, uh, so friends, this is part of the module four. I hope everyone can hear me, right? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, so this is part of the module four of the training manual and uh, page sixty-seven. Thanks a lot, Paolo, for uh, mentioning this uh, in the morning. And uh, this is, we should have done this for every session. So friends, this is a very important session. You know, when Shobha was uh, leading the uh, the whole um, uh, brainstorming on developing this, I think this was one of the areas where we have uh, ourselves learned a lot from other people too, uh, and how to, what, what to keep in mind when we are, uh, you know, and how to prepare for community-led documentation to gather evidence for media, for legal recourse, for advocacy, for policy change uh, in different situations and contexts around them. Um, uh, you know, related to gender equality, and there is a range of whole spectrum of uh, of situations you can uh, come up with, and you already know, you, all of you, each one of you uh, are already part of uh, or already have experienced situations uh, of, of of that wide spectrum of um, of of situations where we need to uh, really prop be prepared to document as well as possible to gather evidence. It could be for media, it could be for lawyers, legal recourse, reporting, for advocacy, for policy change, etc. So, and of course, to engage media. So, uh, uh, friends, sub, most important here is that community that uh, we need, as Rita has also pointed out, we should not do harm. So we need to assess all possible risks to all the community members, including all possible risks to your own self, plus who are those who are helping us with on-spot documentation, those who are being documented and affected communities at large. And all what Rita has said right before at, uh, in, the, in, in her 
legacy talk i will say because it is such an in depth and such um, uh, such a comprehensive one on range of very important issues uh, for gender sensitive reporting and uh, not to do more harm and of course for what she said yesterday i think those all those values and important and points will come handy also as you know we um, uh, we should not be using a uh, regular smartphone which we or phones which we are using because uh, uh, this often these phones are uh, have access to sensitive data like your one drive your uh, dropbox etc or your emails etc or any other whatsapp or other kind of uh, 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 platforms which you might be using to communicate with activists and like minded group so if there is a risk of confiscation in such a situation probably it is better to take another kind another phone or if you do not have those resources if there is a problem then at least log out of or delete or remove that sensitive data from your regular phone before going to such a situation for uh using that device for documentation uh, and uh, the all these inputs are based upon real life uh, experiences uh shared by those who uh, who have dealt with uh, reporting documentation in such situations um also it is not advisable to use a pattern lock as some phones have it but rather have a strong better password for to protect your mobile phone always remember uh, your mobile device uh, if uh, you have a smartphone uh, is, a, is a potential gateway for uh, people who try to hack or try to and if it gets confiscated by authorities or to anyone gets lost then lot of information is there on your phone um we all, of course law many of us use our phones for audio, as audio recorder video recorder for documentation purposes so please make sure that batteries are charged up there is enough memory space um uh, there is enough in, in internet data of uh, what you might be needing for whatever requirement just uh, uh, for like, for example if you are live streaming um, or uh, or other kind of situations where you might need net if at all if it is available of course um uh, keep uh, and if it is possible then please keep a power bank with you if the battery runs out you can at least uh, power your phone like i know my phone if it is 100% charged it can run for about 3 hours 2 and 1/2 to 3 hours so uh, so i have this mind you know i know in the background like i can run uh, i can record till 2 2 and 1/2 hours and then i will need battery backup or uh, electrical socket similarly if you turn on gps for higher accuracy on your mobile phone if there is such if it is possible then it will show you exact location or at least a relevant location uh, that is also if it you know, could could help uh, if it is safe uh, uh 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 to and doc then doc then document who is filming who uh, add information about the person who is filming or consider verbally stating the person's name and providing more information here the catch line is if it is safe uh verbally state the date time location as well as keep the date time stamp and location via gps if possible if available etc in recording uh, all of us might have struggled at some point uh, you know where we have old videos and old photos and we are struggling to uh, really identify uh, the exact timeline or uh, for 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 or date line for that for those uh, uh, you know photos or videos or documents so it is always good if you have this um of course you need to check with your own legal framework experts if it, if this kind of documentation will at all help and what will help uh, to document such a situation capture other visual information that verifies date time location in the footage so, so for instance uh, before writing this before being part of this manual you know like um, i was i was more i, I fancy taking more close up photos with my mobile phone but now i realize the importance of taking longer shots shots also wide angle shots too so that more context comes in if we are doing it for evidence if we are doing it for media so it is possible to prove um, where was this uh, particular violation happening in different context uh, it could be road it could be street sign landmarks buildings trees other identifiers and again if safe if relevant things might be very different for uh, different people different situations where appropriate and where possible film with intention 
uh, you know you can you can plan it if possible uh, record event incidents as they happen from the start to the end uh, if it is if it is relevant again but in some situations this is really important record continuously if possible uh, hold your shots steady and for at least 10 seconds move the camera very slowly and avoid unnecessary zooming uh, you can uh, take photographs where possible, of course, with consent, uh, if, if relevant, uh, multiple shots from different angles so that you can really choose the best ones. Uh, a very slow 360 degree pan to provide context and show what is happening behind the scene and to ensure the video can be more easily verified. Um, uh, and again, I repeat, the, all these inputs have come from people who have been documenting in such situations. Uh, wide establishing shots to provide wide angle shots so that more context come in uh, of, of, uh, for, for uh, evidence purposes with time, date, and location. Medium shots to establish the location of the evidence in the crime scene and close up for key details and identifying people in the scene. And again, this might be very different for different situations. So for, instance, for example, for gender-based violence uh, such situations, probably we will not like to identify uh, at all. We will, we will, in India, in Indian legal context, we will not like to, we are not allowed to um, uh, share publicly any identifier uh, while documenting that. So, um, uh, of course, you, this is another very important one. We have to think before we share. So before we upload any video or live stream, we just think about your legal framework, think about uh, all the possible consequences for, for the person who is most affected, most important. We do, we do not have to risk any more harm for that person, consent of that person, et cetera, of, uh, harm to you, harm to other people who are hosting you, supporting you, providing you that information, affected communities. In 2009, I was um, asked to do documentation on mental health. So I was very conscious of, made very conscious by the local hosts that we should be not be, I should not do anything to uh, put people who are hosting me in their homes, uh, helping me out, do my work. Uh, they are they because they come at risk. So these are very important lessons. We don't want to do more harm. Consider first sharing or going to a trusted activist or trusted lawyers. Use it in locally, so you will probably find a better advice. Um, and uh, we all know messaging app which are more secure, like uh, uh, like Signal or Telegram. Uh, that is what I've heard. I am not a tech person, but this is what I've learned that probably these are more. Uh, preferred. Um, we should save the original fi video file, especially if it is for evidence purposes, without changing the original file name in a safe place and preferably a cloud storage. You can create free accounts of cloud storage. They have come up, up come with limited memory, but you can attach it with different email addresses. So you can, ex uh, you can have several accounts on cloud storage, uh, free cloud storage to save more video files, which are heavier in size. Uh, if there is a resource uh, issue, which most of us always deal with, have two or more backups of that file, just in case if um, there is some corruption, file goes corrupt or something, if it is really sensitive, um, and make a copy of that file when you need to edit, when you need to crop, trim, etc., or, you know, share. Um, I, th the, the, I think I will like, uh, I'll not read it verbatim, there's no need. Uh, but uh, I think, and we need to thank uh, the witness.org for this excellent uh, doc, uh, tips that when we have camera at a protest, we can, uh, that can make us target for police. So we need to uh, wear something which can identify us as a way that we are live streamer. We are live streaming for media so or social media for our newsletter so that police or authorities know that if it is relevant again. Uh, and we can, we should also try anonymizing protesters. And uh, anonymity is important. We can protect their identity. We can, we, for example, by we can film their feet or back or capturing very wide shots so that no one person is identified. Uh, you know, when we make it public, uh, if it is relevant, and there are situations where this may be useful. There are situations where you may actually need to, uh, uh, where, where this may not be very helpful at all. So understand what location details you are sharing with your live stream. That is again uh, an important one. Uh, 
also th there are different purposes for doing this so for example if you're doing this for uh, for um, for, uh, for media document like a media or a, you are a media then probably you need to describe what is happening you can recap what is happening factual unbiased commentary if possible interviews uh, engage viewers um, if it is possible again you know this this is so such a dynamic situation uh, but if you are documenting for evidence purposes that is very different that is where you will have more different kind of an approach where you are documenting taking wide angle shot 360 degree not trying uh, trying to hide identities of people that is a very different uh, that would be a very different one uh, so um, i will quickly uh, share one more important thing which uh, is in the manual again so so let me see where has oops so uh, in the manual you will you will see this uh, chart and uh, this is again from uh, curtsy or oh this sorry friends uh, there was some problem sharing uh that chart but uh, th th there is a chart and it is actually in uh, uh, um, you need to turn your manual uh, 90 degrees to have a look so just hold on i'm trying because that is a really important one and the, and i promise that will be the last boring part <laughs> here oops okay So can you all see the chart here or not? Not yet. No. Okay. All right. Can you see the yes. chart now? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. Okay, so uh, this is a quick one. So initial meeting risk analysis, it is, if possible, please do it. If uh, with, with lawyers, filmers, uh, human right observers. So uh, what can, what are the roles and responsibilities and divide it if, if, if you have a team, like who's documenting to gather police evidence, police violence, who's, who's doing interviews, who's doing specific themes, like uh, capturing different kinds of violations which have happened in different situations or different situations, you know, it could be, uh, we are talking of a broad range of situations here. We can divide who's filming for journalistic purposes, who will film, film for evidentiary purposes. And you, you can now imagine why I'm saying so, because the whole approach might change for different purposes. Uh, so for example, who person who is documenting for journalistic purposes may require internet if it is available there, etc. doing more interviews, giving up uh, commentary. Person who is doing for evidentiary purposes should remain quiet so that um, more of the uh, audio gets recorded, uh, more of the uh, evidence gets recorded without his or her own voice or commentary that is not required at that most, most often. Det then we need to determine how we are communicating, um, like we, whether we are using Telegram, chat, if it is possible, it is good to have that understanding with the core group of activists or media self -dist then often some people use self-destructive messages, messages which flash for a few minutes, few seconds, and then they, uh, they disappear from those uh, platforms like Telegram or Signal. I think WhatsApp also have that kind of a function, but I'm not much of a tech person. Uh, also, it is always good to have emergency contacts, uh, as you mean, uh, it, and uh, know your route beforehand if possible. Sorry, anyone? Okay. Uh, and establish. Okay. So, uh, sorry for this. Yeah. So, um, uh, and and uh, if we all can agree where we will meet after uh, after that documentation, that is also good. Always remember, uh, we need um, uh, if we are filming, th there are people on the street who may have uh, more uh, in you know who who could be great help. And uh, so, for example, 
uh, we can uh, we need to back up. But uh, for example, if we run out of battery, there are people on the street who usually have those functions because they are often work from the street. So it could be roadside vendors, it could be people who like Uber or Ola or motorcycle uh, taxis or motor taxis or any uh, other uh, place where you might find some kind of help. Um, uh, I also found this very interesting that uh, like it, this depends upon different contexts. If you are using a judicial proceedings in accordance with the law, lawyers can submit a specific footage raw or raw ones. Uh, so uh, make sure again, don't change the name of the file. Don't change the format of the file. Try to keep it uh, wherever possible, the original ones and make a copy of our original one. And then you can convert it into different formats or, or crop, etc. So make sure you have it uh, safely stored. You try as possible use a free uh, cloud storage so that if something happens to the computer hard drive your data is at least uh, safe uh, this part i've already covered the motor taxis people on back couriers uh, this is about the police station in some cases the video content can be shown there uh, make sure you if possible you are documenting the police station the name of the police officers the, or the lawyers who are accompanying them uh, police violence Film the action from a safe angle. Do not interfere. This is very, very important. Uh, maintain a distance. Don't stop recording. In such a situation, it needs to be done uh, if possible, if you if it is done being done for evidentiary purposes. And be sure to capture the audio. Uh, remember to film the wounded and get statements from medical personnel on site so they can give you medical details, all with consent, especially when it comes to the person who's wounded or affected communities. Make sure we are not doing more harm than good uh, again uh, for police actions or other kind of things the, the or, or very extreme situations you will find a lot a lot more inputs from those who have uh, who have more experience in in doing this uh, uh, this is very important in our experience also uh, shobha and i have been doing all, um, uh, all different uh, you know activism programs on uh, and involved with several activists here in the locally uh, uh, and over the years we have seen that uh, the local intelligence people will come as uh, uh, as plain cloth people so now uh, to get together intelligence input of what we are doing who is organizing it take down note down the numbers of the people who are key organizers that is routine uh, so this is in our context but uh, i don't know about you, your individual context so make sure uh, just be aware that there could be under undercover cops there could be a plain clothed people um so uh, uh it is important uh to just have have this this is another good input from an, a few people that it is good to make an inventory of all equipment you are carrying to doing emergency situation reporting um and, uh, all the uh, of all the gear take a photo of all the things which you are carrying and leave it behind uh, so that in case it is damaged or confiscated by the police you have exact details of the model of the phone number of, of all the specific th things i forgot imei or some you know there are very specific identifiers of all the devices which we usually carry uh, so which we can uh, which will later on could become uh, very handy uh, so uh, uh, yeah uh, ashoba i think uh, we might not be doing very good on time perhaps uh, so uh, yes we can are i have one more yeah please possible? please yeah. go ahead or or yes. no go ahead yeah. Oops. Okay. Okay. So uh, again, friends, uh, th this is in the manual section. It is uh, just reminding everyone that this is module four, and uh, oops, I don't know why uh, I'm a bit struggling here with the. Uh, screen sharing so sorry for the interruption no so this is another very important uh, tip uh, sheet from witness.org 
and i will encourage all of you to go through it and uh, quickly take you through it like in, we need to this is these are good tips to conceal identities of people while filming so uh, for example we don't have to uh, film uh, faces so we can film hands for example or we can cover their face we can blur face one tip which shubha has been using in cns is to cover it to record them from behind or or from uh, with lot of light in front of them so they, basically this zero identifier it's very difficult to identify thing there's no need to uh, depict faces of uh, people especially when we are uh, documenting affected community voices uh, and again it is if it is relevant uh, there could be activists uh, uh, from affected communities who are uh, who want to go on record um, and there are there we have some in the room as well so welcome and uh, you all have inspired me and that's why i'm sharing this experience uh, similarly, this is another good one from fitness.org of Silhout, Silhout AF, uh, I don't know whether I'm pronouncing the word right or not, but a Silhout F effect. And uh, here they have, uh, they have again mentioned uh, if there is a strong light behind and the person is sitting in front here. Uh, then probably, and if you use your camera, when I, when I use my camera, so wherever I tap, the focus becomes, uh, focus goes on that part. So it, if you, if I tap on the subjects of the person's face, sorry, I don't like the word subject but of the person's face, then the, then the person's face will become, it will come in focus and uh, other things might go out of focus or with less, less, less in focus. And if I tap on my camera uh, phone screen, on the, for example, on this window, then probably the fo the fo the um, the focus on the face will go away and will be more on the uh, behind, uh, which is which might be required here for cell out effect. The, here is there is another way which they have tried to do. There is a wall here. There is a strong light here. There is a white screen here and chair and camera to record uh, statements and conceal identity. Um, about camera blur, very recently, two weeks ago, as I said yesterday, while documenting uh, one case of uh, one one of our one one person we know personally who uh, was uh, um, gang raped by a few men. Uh, the, uh, so while documenting that, we had to use this. I did not know how to do this. So another friend of ours uh, helped us uh, the blur the face uh, for that. Uh, so this is really, very, really, very important, especially in the context of local laws. But most important is the, the what is the person who's most affected and at risk? What is that person's wish? And that person's wish was to conceal the identity. So we did that. Uh, there's no need to, uh, I don't, uh, to, to share those kind of details. Uh, about editing software, etc. I will just leave it for you all to read because this is such a big topic and uh, I have more to learn on this than, than you know, come here and uh, uh, um, share things yeah so so that's all friends uh, from my side um, any any questions comments or in interest of time we can also move ahead up to you uh, thank you thank you bobby thank you for highlighting very important finer points which we sometimes tend to overlook or omit especially in crisis and humanitarian situations and emergency situations uh, we have a question from paolo that nowadays it is also easy to fabricate false information or data about someone if they want to tarnish someone's image. Uh, can you provide some tips on this? Yes. Uh... Right, Paolo. So this is very much possible. This also happens with the in social movements and people's movements where false or fabricated evidence goes around. Um, so. Uh, counter that uh, to try to uh, you know counter that 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 is the only only thing which I need to which I can say here or try to find flaws in that video uh, if it is possible take it to experts maybe they can expose it that this is uh, digitally morphed or digitally uh, modified uh, evidence and this is actually not real uh, 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 Try to counter that uh, that false narrative. That the 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 lie will not uh, lie does not have too uh, too much of a life. So so try to try to stick with truth, and most likely it will probably um, help. I don't know how to 
best respond to this but if it is a photograph if it is a video if it is a narrative if it is textual text i mean then uh, uh, it, it, the approaches could differ but basically it, it is more important to uh, to counter that fake Thank news and involvement of trolls is also effective okay. yes absolutely edna right so true uh, uh, fake news is a huge issue here and uh, there are important credible websites now in india which have come up which uh, keep on uh, verifying whether this news is fake or real and uh, so it is always important to check whether the news is fake or real if it is very sensitive before sharing it any further uh, so very true Okay. Thank you, Vikta, uh, for sharing you. things. Yeah, mask thank comment is also good. Sorry, Shubha, go ahead. Yes, yes, no, please go ahead because uh, uh, we can take up some of the questions maybe later on also um, at the end of the of this session. So uh, our next speaker is Somita Thapar, a media and advocacy professional who is a media communication specialist as well. Uh, and uh, over to you, Somita, now. Thank you very much. Shobhaji, thank you so much, Bobby. Such an honor and a privilege and so inspiring to be here with all of you all. Really, it's been, you know, like two days, two and a half, two days plus today of uh, so much uh, um, information, so much sharing, and uh, I'm really happy to be with everyone. So uh, I'm actually just going to be, you know, sharing some, uh, uh, you know, uh, clues and tips on uh, using social media for uh, engagement. And this is, uh, you know, based on some of the work that, you know, I have done over the last couple of years. Um, and it's just like some broad brush strokes of, uh, uh, you know, how we can use various social, social media handles for the kind of work that we do to advance uh, discourse. So the first um, thing that came to my mind is that, you know, it's really important to choose the media uh, handles that we want to invest in. So, you know, sometimes we think that, uh, you know, we should be on every social media handle uh, because it's free. So how does it matter? But, uh, you know, the thing is that when we manage a social media handle, then it requires a lot of time and input and resource. So, uh, you know, all of that is an investment that we are making. So what I have found really effective for myself based on, you know, the base kind of work that I have done is that, you know, when we start, we can be on all and then we see and figure out for ourselves which one works best for what situation. So for example, these days I manage the SBCC Alliance. SBCC is the Social and Behavior Change Communication Alliance that is hosted by the C40 section of UNICEF India. And uh, over the last couple of months, I found that Twitter works the best for us. So there's a Facebook page as well, and there's also an Insta, but in this work, uh, to interact with other people to uh, who work in the same area. It's Twitter that has worked best for us. But some time back, I was, you know, uh, helping a craft store, uh, you know, uh, promote some of their products and uh, processes, you know, some of the cultural performances. And for that, obviously, I mean, Insta worked best. So, uh, you know, based on the work that we are doing, you know, we need to just figure out which one needs the maximum investment. Because the thing is that, it's really important that whatever we choose to be on, it is, uh, uh, you know, you have to be consistent in your engagement on that. And you can figure out for yourself what that consistency should be. So say um, uh, at the SPCC Alliance, we, uh, we have agreed that, you know, all five working days of the week, we need to engage at least once a day. So some years ago, I was, uh, uh, you know, part of the key correspondence uh, social media handle that is man, uh, hosted by HIV AIDS Alliance in the in Brighton, and there, uh, you know, all five days of the week, every hour we were tweeting. So, which meant that you know somebody curated the day's tweets. So, from a nine a.m. to a four p.m., that every hour a tweet is going out, and we could schedule the tweets. So, and we found that you know, since a lot of people who are scheduling tweets are doing it to the hour it makes sense to just maybe do it say four minutes past the hour. So that way there is a constant engagement. You are ensuring that, you know, your social media handle has a constant engagement, but it, but you know, you can do it at one go and you can come back to it and respond and engage when you have the time rather than, you know, just doing that all day because then otherwise no other work gets done. So you can in that way prevent from being distracted yourself. Um, 
the other thing i find is that you know the, this whole digital ecosystem i mean there is a certain there are certain values around it and it's important that you know in order to make the most of this space we um, you know understand those values and we embrace them fully so for example it's democratic it's non hierarchical uh, you know it's about sharing it's about promoting it's about working together collaborating those kind of ideas so uh, you know you can be on your social media handle and do your own thing and yet it's also important that you make sure that you are also uh, collaborating promoting liking retweeting what other people in your network are doing because then in a way you do that and then they do it for you so therefore then you know we are helping each other and uh, expanding our networks you know making connections happen so uh, yeah it's like the whole ecosystem is like an ocean so how can we navigate it best in order to swim in order to dive deep in order to advance the work that we are doing to create new connections to create more conversations so um, it's really important that you know to be on uh, a social media handle and uh, to ensure that we are amplifying the work that our partners that other people around us uh, working on similar issues are doing for mutual benefit so uh, it's a partnership it's a collaboration and everyone benefits that is the idea behind it and you know as like uh, you know i manage the sbcc alliance uh, social media handle so then you know it becomes my responsibility and my mandate to also ensure that you know the partners work gets amplified our own team members work so if you know one of our own team members has put something then you know that you know if i share and i retweet then that person also gets you know that wide uh, uh, audience that the uh, that the alliance handle has so uh, i find that to be very useful and very effective we found that visuals are crucial when we are looking at social media content and i mean i mean research has also shown that across that uh, you know all of us are most of the time you know looking at content on our phone or even if you're using a desktop or a laptop we are scrolling faster than we are reading so which means that if you really want to catch people's attention a visual really really helps it could be a video it could be an image it could be an infographic it could be a photograph but visuals are really important to hold people's attention so it's important to invest in that so which means that you know whether it's a facebook post or a twitter or an i mean insta of course is uh, you know it drives on uh, visual content but even for the rest that we make sure that there is enough uh, you know good visual content that we can share because that makes it even more uh, likely that your uh, um, content will be noticed and also because you know when one is scrolling and it's very easy to stop and pause at something that interests you so that way um, it's easier to catch attention of people who you want should read what you are saying um so yes good visual content good photographs good images good videos really really important um a lot of us are now using social media for events and i think that's really really uh, very very beneficial and very very effective whether it's facebook live or insta you know all of these mediums that we are using to do events um i found that really effective and also to promote events so if you're doing a real event or a webinar to use twitter to promote you know that it's it's happening in a couple of days you can register here or even you know it's happening in a day or that is happening right now so that really helps um and yet again i also found that you know sometimes it's important to see will a live tweeting a, a, an event work better or would it be better to create a thread so for example there was a fireside chat that i was supposed to live tweet on a late friday evening here for us so um it, it occurred to me that you know it's unlikely that if i'm live tweeting is going to bring in more audience so instead then you know i decided that i'm going to do a tweet thread so maybe just you know put together a thread of 10 tweets and that way it can be more considered it can be more contemplative i can you know add the hashtags and tag the people so uh and then i decided to do that so you know it's it's you know it's up to us to figure out how best to use uh social media to uh promote events to document events uh and that's really really useful so for example if someone has missed the event just looking at those 10 uh, uh 
uh, tweets will give some indication of this is what happened. And then if that person is interested, they can always, uh, you know, go back and look at the recording. Um, so, you know, wherever, you know, we are tweeting and, uh, you know, we always kind of make sure that, you know, we tag people, we add hashtags. And that is so that, uh, you know, if you're tagging people, then, uh, you know, uh, other people get to know whom to follow and how to find those people. And, uh, you know, when you add a hashtag, then it, uh, you are more easily found. So if people are searching for specific conversations, uh, they, it will be easier for them to find you. So um, it really helps to tag people to add hashtags so that then um, it is adding to a body of knowledge and, uh, you know, a body of work that we are all working together, doing together. Um, and that takes me to the next point, which is, you know, to be part of knowledge creation. So as people who are, uh, you know, using social, social media and managing social media handles, one thing is that we're liking and retweeting and sharing. And that, of course, is great. But then it's also important, I feel that, you know, to be seen as creators of knowledge, brokers of knowledge. So which means then to ensure that in the content that we put out, are we linking to maybe new stories that we have done, uh, you know, and maybe it can link it to something that has come on, on a website, or is it linking up to uh, new research, new findings, human interest stories, stories from the field, photos from the field. It's important that uh, we are not just, uh, you know, like swimming out there, but uh, ensuring that we are adding to knowledge on the issues that we work in. And that is how, you know, we can uh, advance this course on that. So these are just a couple of thoughts and ideas that I found really useful and effective in, uh, you know, um, handling and engaging with social media. Um, to, you know, constantly ask ourselves, how am I contributing to the discourse and what I can do best to advance the discourse better? How can I help other people working on similar issues uh, to amplify their voice? Uh, you know, also to be current and newsy and contemporary. So, which is why we use all anniversaries. So if, uh, you know, this is 16 days of, you know, um, uh, you, you know, uh, 16 days dedicated to looking at, you know, issues of violence, you know, if it is a, uh, all the different anniversaries and days to make sure that, you know, you're using those days to commemorate, to talk about issues, and that way then to be part of a larger conversation so that we can together work, work and partner and collaborate to um, advance discourse on issues. So that is basically about it that, uh, you know, I have, and I'm really happy to, you know, take any questions, comments. Thank you very much, Sukmita. Thank you very much for this very informative and enriching uh, sharing which you have done around social media engagement. We, I am sure all of us have learned a lot many new things from you today also. So thank you very much. And uh, we have a good comment from Yashoda Kura. And she says, thank you for an excellent session. Toolkits are very important for all how to address, for all of us, to how to address gender sensitive issues, which are very often not seen. This has been a very much needed training and often such sessions are required to refresh our knowledge on how to show empathy, be non-discriminative, be equal and non-judgmental and survivor-centric survivor approaches. Now, if uh, there are any more comments and questions, uh, participants, please type them in the chat box and we will take them up. Uh, we are running short of time, but time is sometimes a culprit which we have to deal with. Uh, Nahid Khalid wants to know tips to use social media in sexual and gender based violent questions. Please share. Do we face trolls or attacks or profiling the risk to person if we share such news? Sorry, I. Don't when we are sharing news on gender-based violence, gender and uh, sexual and gender-based violence, then there could be trolls there and how to how to manage such news on social media. Mm. 
you know i really haven't done it so you know i am based on you know bobby's what bobby just did you know uh, a couple of minutes ago you know i would just say the same prim- principles would apply so which means do no harm play as safe as possible protect identity uh, so the general rules of what applies to media should also apply here i mean that would and it's also i think better to err on this side so you know protect identity uh, do no harm so that's what you know i would uh, say i don't really have i mean specific for uh, uh, this because i haven't really worked on it but uh, broadly speaking this is how i would do it and um, uh, yeah Okay, uh, uh, Kalyani Thapa wants to know how important is captions? Are important? How important are captions when sharing pictures on social media platforms? I think they're really important, very very important. In fact, uh, we give a lot of attention to that. So you know, uh, you know. In fact, uh, you know, in some organizations, we even have like really full uh, guidelines on how to caption. So which means that you know, maybe it's you want to say the name of the Uh, the village the district the town the locality when it was done you know so whether it's october or november 2021 2020 so uh, and describing in a line or two lines what is happening so uh, and also to give due credit to the photographer to the organization who has uh, you know given that uh, picture so i would think that it's really really uh, very important and we must uh, make sure that all of that information comes in Okay, thank you. Varuni from Thailand wants to know: in crisis or emergency, help appeals. Uh, what social media would work best? Uh, sorry, I really haven't worked on it. I wouldn't be able to answer. Yes, yes. May- maybe uh, Bobby, can you chip in there? In case of crisis, because it is, yes, we are talking of crisis situations. So. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, actually, I will just echo what the Sumita said. And Varuni, probably the answer lies uh with you and your community uh, of what works in uh, specific situations in your community. What, what, what kind of media will be the best for uh, the uh, people uh, you are trying to seek attention from? So, it, is it the government or is it? Uh, do they use Twitter? Do they use uh, like in Thailand? Probably they use Line a lot or other platforms. Language, for example. So if I have to do it, I probably might. If I have to do it, I'm currently in Lucknow, um, uh, so um, so I will probably tweet and maybe in Hindi if I have to attract attention of my local authorities or or and tag them. As Sumita had so rightly pointed out, uh, we'll find out the right handles if we are using Twitter, if it is relevant, if it is appropriate. But actually, the answer lies. Um, probably you have to find the answer. Uh, you have to find the right platform. right approach right how to tag etc might differ from platform to platform uh, maybe nothing of this may work and you may have to have a different kind of approach given the context and situations uh, so yeah thanks a lot for raising that point though very important one because we need to select we need to go for the best possible option on how to get attention in emergency and crisis situations to get help yes thanks uh- Uh, Bobby, would you respond to Mansid Dimi's uh, uh, a question also on how to schedule posts on social media? Yes, uh, thanks a lot for asking this. As uh, Sumita had so rightly pointed out too. So uh, actually, I was trying to. Uh, uh, I'll just share my screen. Uh, can you all see my screen? Is that okay? No. Hello. No. No. Okay. Not yet, Bobby. Yeah, no, we can, can see. All right. So this is this is my Twitter. So so for example, if I tweet something here, you will find this box. Can you all see this box? This box. Yes. Yes. So if yes. you click on this box, you will find that it will there a schedule option will come up in Twitter. And in my experience, you can schedule as many tweets as possible for free. This you can select the month. You can select the day. You can select the time. The time zone. And 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 schedule it. The other option which uh, uh, which I would like to introduce is Hootsuite. Hootsuite, uh, you can have a free trial too. There, I have not used it in for since two three years, but I have used it before uh, two three years a lot. 
uh, and in before two three years there were free packages also, but there were limitations that how number of tweets which you can uh, or po Facebook posts or LinkedIn etc. But right now I'm not very sure uh, how it works, but it is really a great platform. Uh, anyways, not just for scheduling but also for monitoring hashtags or uh, Twitter handles. Um, Buffer is another one which we daily use. Uh, Shobha and uh, I uh, have been using it since several years with Inish. Um, the key correspondence program of International HIV AIDS Alliance, which Sumita mentioned, was founded by Tim France of Inish Communication in the late 90s. Uh, so, so Buffer is definitely uh, another good one. Again, free, there are free plans and free plans may have some limitations. Uh, but, uh, but if you are trying to schedule things on Twitter, I think Twitter's inbuilt scheduling function, which you can use probably, I think it only works with if you use a computer, but uh, maybe they have uh, opened it or, or via phone too. I'm not very aware of that part, but on a computer, it definitely works. So that that works uh, very well too. And there, there are, again, friends, there are many more tools as well. So we uh, ought to schedule uh, posts on uh, social media. So, uh, so uh, explore, uh, you know, with your um, uh, uh, communities on what works best uh, in your setting. Yeah. Yes, yes. And uh, there are uh, some comments from uh, uh, Paolo, who says that uh, 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 social media functions vary as now Twitter, if you want your message across fast, Instagram, if you want to share photos, LinkedIn for job opportunities, etc. Yeah. Uh, yes, and Ekta Vivek shares her experience that Twitter works best for emergencies, but they have used we have used Facebook extensively as well uh, during the second wave. Right. Yes, right, and just quickly bore you with a very small story, you know, uh, and I could be wrong. So please correct me. But if I remember correctly, and if my memory is helping me here, uh, probably Twitter, you know, Twitter people who founded Twitter, who were running Twitter, in early days, they did not think that Twitter will work the way it is, we are using it. So in San Francisco or California, someplace, there was some crisis situations, uh, I think, uh, and people started using Twitter as a as a tool to alert what's happening and that's how uh, the, the whole new dimension of uh, how users are going to use twitter was uh, you know became so pop popular but i could be very wrong but you are very right great tips yeah yes yeah. so thank you and the conversation does not end although the session ends but the conversation and dialogue continues and uh, we come to the end of this training session and in these three days, we have heard from experts about the various global treaties and conventions that our countries have promised to implement to achieve gender justice, as well as where countries stand in terms of achieving these goals. We have also discussed how gender justice advocates can strengthen their collaboration with media for increasing sensitive and rights-based sustained coverage, and how media can play a very, very important and significant role in this whole ongoing process. I'm sure this has equipped us better and honed our skills to work in a coordinated manner for dismantling patriarchy and advancing gender equality. My sincere thanks to all the participants and resource persons. Special thanks to Evelyn Gomez and her team from Arrow for making this training happen. But just a moment before we leave, let us once again create a Zoom storm. Please try each one of you, I would request each one of the participants to please type briefly one take home message from these three days of training. And your time begins now. So I want the chat box to be stormed now. The storm is building up, yes.
excuse me uh, hello yes hello uh, yes uh, shobha actually i am visually impaired and you know when i type uh, on my screen with my hands you know can, it's very slow so can no. i just yes please speak out bobby will type it out okay uh, yes please uh, the sessions went uh, very excellent uh, because uh, uh, we've had clear understanding about uh, how transparent are these conventions yes this past okay yes okay yes yeah thanks thank you very much thank you so thank you for that and now namaste till we meet again please stay safe stay healthy and stay empowered because that is what has been the take home message for me thank you very much yes thank you so much thank you, thank you so everyone. much thank you everyone thank you thank you so thank much you. Thank, thank you to engage thank again you, like thank all of us yes. Yes. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, thank you, my friend. Thank, thank you, Doctor P. S. Sharma. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you I beg Thank to you. differ. Really, I beg. I agree. <laughs> I beg to differ. I beg to differ. It is only you all who have made it so vibrant and informative and exciting. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. It's all so bad, Bobby. Thank all of all. us. Thank yes. you. Yes, all of us made this happen. So thanks yes, a lot to everyone. It. Thank yes. you, Rita. Yes. Salutes to you always. Thank you, Sumita. Thank you, everyone. We need the materials to materials. Yes, all materials, friends. All recordings, all presentations. If parts, if experts have shared it with us, everything we will send it back to you along with a link to enter your name, uh, check your name for uh, the certificate, which Eru will send it directly to you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very everyone. much. Thank have you. A, Bye. Stay safe. Bye. And all the best bye bye. for the days of activism. Power to you all. Bye bye, Shubha, Babi. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 Bye.